Welcome back into the Door Report, episode 236 on a lovely Wednesday evening, September 6th. Here at the Door Report, we are presented by Corey Perkins of Parks Realty. If you are currently a Vanderbilt fan or any person in the Nashville area looking to buy a home for the first time or move houses, Corey Perkins is your man. You can reach out to Corey via phone call or text at 615-987-8623, or you can reach out to him via email at Corey Perkins at Realtracks.com. Realtracks spelled R-E-A-L-T-R-A-C-S dot com. I am Will Byram, joined as always by my co-host Trevor Hoolan. And Trevor, we have maybe, in quotations and question marks, the biggest game of the year to preview right now. Vanderbilt takes on Wake Forest out of the ACC at 10 a.m. this Saturday. Disgusting. How are you feeling, first off, about the kickoff time, Trevor? I mean, it doesn't bother me. Go ahead and just get it over with. Just Because this, this game is going to make me so nervous as is that I probably do would just want to go ahead and get it over with and then I don't have to worry how the rest of my day is going to be. I can just sort of either sulk or be uh, elated. So it's fine with me. As a viewer on TV, I don't mind the 10 a.m. kickoff. Just get it out of the way. Get it out of the way early. Let me know how the rest of my day is going to go. Let me know how the rest of my weekend is going to go. Mm-hmm. Even even with the NFL season beginning on Sunday, having a 10 a.m. kickoff is not the worst thing. Vanderbilt's going to be in the national spotlight for the first hour. But... If this was a home game, we would be furious oh, be at so a 10 a.m. kick. Do you know you can't even tailgate a 10 a.m. kick? Like when we're getting out there early, we're getting out there at 8 a.m. By the time we're set up, it's 8 30. You would be wanting to go into the stadium by 9 a.m. as Phoebe makes her first appearance in the intro as always. So the 10 a.m. kickoff is odd, but that that game will be on ACC on the ACC network. Trevor, how are the vibes currently? How are the vibes feeling after you've had a little bit of time to digest the Alabama A&M win, you've had time to fully digest the Hawaii win, and now you've had time to look forward to the Wake Forest game? How are the vibes? Uh, nervy. I'm very nervous about this game. On a vibe check on a scale of 1 to 10, we're at a shaky 6 right now. Very shaky 6. A shaky 6. Yeah, I don't do... And, and we'll get into it, but I, the more I think about it, the, the more I have bad thoughts about this game. This is an interesting game to break down. Reading the previews from sites across college football coverage, from Wake Forest fr- fans, from Vanderbilt fans, this is a tough game to evaluate. And I think the line has been a good example of why this is a tough game to evaluate, even with Vegas with all the brains involved in the gambling operations in Vegas, they have had a tough time setting this line. And we'll get into that line, the over-under, and much more in episode 236 here. Vanderbilt's released their depth chart, some injury updates. Why should we talk about it? Depth depth charts don't matter. We shouldn't even talk about it. Yeah, just don't even talk about the depth chart. doesn't even matter. That still makes me angry. I know how this depth chart works, guys. I understand. You, You who will not be named misunderstood the point of my tweet and it's still bothering me hack squat just doesn't know ball breaking you just news. don't know ball i mean that's the key trevor you just don't know ball i'm gonna how the hell again. am i even on this podcast i'm gonna repeat it again as as the review from the lot two lizard said you uh, you've been make a wish gifted a platform here yeah so i'm waiting don't for know ball. john cena to bust the wall right now <laughs> but we have some key injury updates uh, that I'm sure Vanderbilt fans will be excited about. Some quotes from Clark Lee. We've also got the Wake Forest preview. We tried, I tried to reach out to a couple people that cover, cover Wake Forest. Uh, no responses. So we're going to do our best uh, to cover Wake Forest and preview that roster to the best of our abilities. And then we have me and Trevor's three keys to the game. And as always, our predictions for the outcome of the game that I've gone back and forth on Trevor and me have labored over. Our predictions. It's been a rough. It's been a rough couple days trying to think about this game, <laughs> especially after two predictions that were relatively easy to make. I don't think there was any controversy in our win predictions over Hawaii or Alabama A and M. This is the first time that you've really had to sit back and evaluate a matchup. And honestly, right now, 
I'm still up in the air. And you have to be honest about it, too. It's you know tough. what I mean? Yeah, it's tough. This Wake Forest offense. We'll get into all this and much more. But before we get into all of that, don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Door Report. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Emphasis. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And while you're at it, give our podcast five stars and a review on iTunes. Emphasis on the five-star review on iTunes. We will be resuming reading off the best five-star reviews on the Wake Forest recap episode. But Trevor, it's now time for breaking news. All right, Trevor, it's time to get into the beef of episode 236. Vanderbilt travels to Winston-Salem, North Carolina to take on Wake Forest at 10 a.m. on the ACC Network, prime time 10 a.m. kickoff. But before we get into the Wake Forest preview or the full game preview, Vanderbilt's released their game three, week two depth chart. A couple changes. Uh... The two that stuck out, tell me if I missed any. There is an or, a new or. Are we, we're back to or season. There's a new or on the depth chart. Tyson Russell or Martell Height. How do you feel about that or being added? I mean, both are going to play, so I don't know if it matters. Like, it, it, that's that part of the depth chart. I'm like, ah, dude, who cares? It's it just, is, yeah. Both are going to play. Both will play significant snaps. Again, Tyson Russell will play significant sta- snaps. Martel Height will play significant snaps. I think the or for me just justifies how fans are feeling. And what we have watched through the first two weeks is there's not much difference right now between Tyson Russell and Martel Height. And if there is any difference, Martel Height is a better pass coverage corner and Tyson Russell's just a better tackler. And right now, that's where we're sitting. So at least there's recognition from this coaching staff that there are problems in the secondary. There was one other change on the depth chart. Jacob Borchilla, there's officially no or next to him and Brock Taylor. There's no or. We have our starting kicker. It's Jacob Borchilla. Does that surprise you? Does that give you any any pause or any cause for concern? I'm um, nope. I mean, first two games, he's looked awesome. So we went into the season saying, make your extra points. He's perfect on extra points and he's perfect on field goals. So yeah, make him the starter. He's earned it. Yeah. No pressure kicks, no tough kick yet, kicks yet for Virchilla, but maybe for the first time we'll see that in the Wake Forest game, but he is officially the starting kicker for the Commodores. We also have some injury updates. Darren Agu and Linus Zunk are both expected to return and play in the Wake Forest game. Darren Agu, I imagine, is at full health. Our beautiful British boy is back. The Thank game, God. the game wrecker off the edge. Our beautiful, beautiful sporting his new number eleven. So you know he's got that dog in him. Got the dog, in big him. boys, little numbers, dog. Uh, massive to have him back. Linus Zunk so far. Um, I know he didn't play last game, but in that first game, I thought he was actually he played surprisingly well, considering he's um a work in progress. Uh, still very raw, but it still made a lot of uh, really good plays. Um, so I think having Darren Agu back is is massive for this um, for this defense. You finally get your pass rusher back. Uh, you can move Issa back inside. Uh, Clark Lee in his press conference said that Issa will still bounce back and forth between outside and inside. Um, that makes absolutely no sense to me. But then again, I'm not a head football coach, and I don't claim to be. Um, I actually don't know ball. Um, he doesn't. That's a, no ball. HMD started that whole thing. I actually think that's really funny on HMD, but Aria, you misrepresented my tweet. Um, it's, it's good to have him back. It's good to have him back. Um, if you see him in a uh, brace, in an elbow brace, don't freak go. out. He's just, he, he probably should have been wearing one his entire career. And Darren Agu at six foot six, 250 pounds, that height we will get into in the Wake Forest preview, why that is so key to have him back on that defensive line, creating disruption. Junior Azebu is questionable with a lower body injury and his backup, Leighton Nelson, also questionable. I think he plays the way, the way, I think so too. yeah, I think he plays when Clark Lee 
I, I don't have any reason behind that, just how he discussed that injury. He's always very vague, but I think Zebu plays. Would this, you be, this is such a huge game. Would you be shocked if Grayson starts at right tackle again? Shocked might be the wrong word. Surprised, maybe. I, I don't know. Intrigued? Intrigued might be a better word. I don't know. Uh, yeah. We'll see. Yeah. there was It was very vague, as always, with college coaches on the injury status of these players. But Dericky Wright is also questionable with the sprained ankle injured it in that Alabama A&M game in that win last week, 47-13. to 13. Clark Lee on that uh, sprained ankle said, we feel good about the way he's progressing. Dericky Wright's going to play. That that's basically what I took away from the Clark Lee presser. My boy, you cannot back, you baby. cannot keep the dog off the leash. Let the dog off the leash. D Rock getting him back is going to be massive. He's one of those guys on the not just the defense, the entire team. You cannot lose him. You know what? Hot take. Him and CJ Taylor. It's not one A one B. They are both number one. You cannot lose either one of them. Yeah, you need Dericky Wright. You need Dericky Wright. Especially in this game, two picks versus Hawaii. Injured early in that Alabama A&M game. Probably could have came back and played in that second half if needed. But fortunately, he was not. Give him a little bit more time to recover. Take both my ankles if you need to. Sprained Take both my ankles. They're they're big. They might not. I've got <laughs> big old ankles. Ugly ankles. Yeah, I would, but they work. I would offer up my ankles as well, but they don't work. I've sprained my ankles many, many times. There's probably some ligament damage in there. So stick that foot in an ice bucket, Dericky, and get on the field, but baby. You have skinny ankles. And you know what they say about skinny ankles? Athlete. 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 Skinny ankles equals athlete. I was told I was inathletic, though, unfortunately. Yeah, by Alabama AM players. Yeah, what, a, what a strange I bet interaction. I, beat, we I had. bet I beat him on 101 on the basketball court, though. Bet a lot of money. You're a good free throw shooter, at least. Good shooter in general. Shooter, shoot, baby. Shooter, shoot, but dude. we have no guest from Wake Forest breaking down this roster. There's been a lot of turnover on the Wake Forest roster, even though a lot of their depth chart and roster has experience and has been in that program for a long time. The number one most obvious change on the Wake Forest roster, Sam Hartman has transferred to Notre Dame. The star quarterback, the Heisman candidate from Wake Forest last season, tore up Vanderbilt 18 of 27 for 300 yards and four touchdowns last season, last year. He's gone. Okay, Commodore fans, he's gone. Mitch Griffiths, that may that name may sound familiar to you. Remember last year, Sam Hartman was recovering from an injury and going into the Vanderbilt Wake Forest game, it was kind of on the fence whether or not Sam Hartman or Mitch Griffiths would be the starting quarterback, but this year is the Mitch Griffiths show. He looked pretty good against Elon, uh, and Clark Lee had a quote on Mitch that I want to read. Clark Lee, in quote, said, uh, in comparison to Sam Hartman, they're, sim they're very similar players. They'll take their risks. They'll take their shots. He went on to say, similar to the way Sam played, Mitch is confident. He makes decisions rapidly. He knows where his matchups are. I think he's impressive that way. There are subtle differences in the way they run, how they run, and how late they will get the ball out. But with, with that quote from Clark Lee, given that they are similar players and their confidence and decision-making, Mitch Griffiths is 5'11", 192 pounds. Sam Hartman is 6'1", 6'2", 212 pounds. I did not know that. There's a huge difference in size of these guys. Mitch Griffiths is a very talented quarterback, but make no mistake. He is not Sam Hartman, okay? Elon is a good FCS program, but I watched every snap of that Wake Forest Elon game, and there were a lot of broken coverages that resulted in that 37-17 to 17 score. Mitch Griffiths was not forced to make accurate throws in tight windows. I'm not saying Vanderbilt secondary is going to force him to do that either, but we don't know a lot about Mitch Griffiths. We've really seen him play a couple games or one game for Wake Forest last year before the return of Sam Hartman. And then we've seen him one game versus an FCS opponent this year. So that's the big question mark or one of the question marks on this Wake Forest offense this year. Can I ask you a question real quick? Let's go. Okay. Um. So I know Clark Lee certainly said it last year, and I believe he even said it this year. Um, in regards to the slow mesh, and particularly with quarterback play, because as you remember last year, as you brought up, Sam Hartman was questionable going into that game. I actually remember sitting at my desk at my old job 
and just checking Twitter and people were like, oh my God, heavy money is coming out on awake. You know what that means. And I literally felt my heart like fall out of my body. I just like sunk into my uh, government chair that has probably been there since 1980. And I just looked at the ceiling and I go, God, why us? And it was bad. And now Clark Lee did say with the slow mesh offense, it's not really the quarterback. It is the system. So even though Wake Forest loses a potential Heisman, he was certainly a dark horse Heisman going into last year. Does this offense still scare you even with Mitch Griffiths? Because it kind of, it's sort of, it doesn't sort of, it absolutely scares me. This offense also pisses me off. I hate this offense. Yeah, this offensive scheme in this general sucks. Scares me with Vanderbilt's issues in the secondary. It scares me regardless. It's definitely less scary to Vanderbilt fans without Sam Hardman. And it's also less scary to Vanderbilt fans without superstar wide receiver A.T. Perry. Dude, he was a gone to the Gone to the NFL last year against Vanderbilt. He had five catches, 142 yards, and a touchdown on the season. A.T. Perry had 81 catches for 1,096 yards and 11 touchdowns. He's gone. No more A.T. Perry. So they lose their number one receiver. Their number two receiver from last year, Donovan Green, is also out for the year with an injury. Who was going to be their number one this year. He was year. going to be their number one this season. He was their second leading receiver last year with 37 catches for 642 yards and six touchdowns against Vanderbilt. He was their second leading receiver as well. Four catches for 53 yards last year in 2022. He will not be on the field for Wake Forest either. So both leading receivers from last year's team are gone. Also, Wake Forest does return their starting running back from last year uh, let me find the name real quick. Justice Ellison, 170 carries, 699 yards, six touchdowns. They returned zero other running backs when, with more than 14 career carries. Their number That's two, a stat that I did not know. Their number two and three running backs, Quentin Cooley, and I don't have his first name written here, but Turner was his last name. Turner had 128 carries for 516 yards and seven touchdowns from last year. He transferred to Indiana. Quentin Cooley, their number three running back, had 51 carries for 246 yards and three touchdowns. He transferred to Liberty. So they do return their starting running back. Justice Ellison will take a majority of the carries, but they do lose depth in that backfield. So they've lost their one number one and number two receivers. They've lost their number one starting quarterback, and they've lost their number two and number three running backs. They do return quite a bit at offensive line, but that offensive line is undersized. I don't understand why there have not been as many holes poked in this Wake Forest offense with how much they lost from last year. I agree. Well, I, you know why? It's because I think probably Clark Lee was onto something whenever he said this particular scheme is more about the scheme than it is the players. Now, with that being said, Whenever you lose a Heisman candidate at quarterback, you are going to drop off. I don't care if you're running the most flawless scheme ever invented in football. You're, there's going to be a drop off. Are we going to see that drop off this weekend in Wake Forest's first game of the season against real competition? Also, with that being said, Vanderbilt's first game against real competition, which True. for Vanderbilt's first game against real competition to go in and see this dumb slow mesh offense startles me. With that being said, they have tape from last year. They're returning a majority of their defense that saw this offense in real time last year. Does that help Vanderbilt? I only am, I only imagine it could help Vanderbilt. And I'm glad you brought up the defense because that Wake Forest defense is likely going to be very improved this year. You said they return a lot of talent. That is very true. Their defensive line against Elon was pretty dominant and very fast. They looked very fast against Elon, and that does give me pause and give me a little bit of hes hesitation going into this matchup for Vanderbilt as their offensive line has seemed to struggle already with a Hawaii pass rush and an Alabama. Well, not as much with Alabama A&M, but definitely with Hawaii's pass rush. You saw Vanderbilt's offensive line struggle. Well, too, it's just like they seem to struggle particularly when Vanderbilt runs RPOs. It's just guys don't know their assignments. They don't know who they're supposed to be on. They don't know whether they're supposed to go upfield, stay and pass pro. They just, it's, it, 
they seem very, very confused. And I think as we've gone back and watched both games, most of the issues that have come from the offensive line pass protection wise has been in these sort of RPO style plays. Um, other than that, they've been actually, I thought fairly good in pass pro run blocking just has not been there period though. Be- they've um, been beat around the edge a couple times. Yeah. A few times, not, not a super concerning amount of times yet, but a lot of the pressures the come, interior. From, come from the interior. The interior yeah, needs to nut up. That's been the weird part. It's been a lot of communication issues, a lot of issues in the interior of that offensive line. And we'll get into that more in the three keys of the game, but on defense, some key names to watch out for Jasheen Davis on the defensive line for Wake Forest led the team with seven sacks last year. He had half a sack against Elon. He is somebody Vanderbilt has to contain on that Wake Forest defensive line. They also returned Jacob Roberts at linebacker, a guy that'll be all over the field making plays and Kalen Carson, a fourth year starter at corner. He did miss some games last year. Uh, the last couple seasons, he's missed games with injury. But Wake Forest does not have another cornerback on their roster who has started more than one college game besides Kalen Carson. Yeah, That, to me, should be a key factor in how this game is evaluated. Vanderbilt secondary certainly has its, is- has its issues. I'm not discounting that. But so does Wake Forest. This yep. Wake Forest defense is not proven. This Wake Forest offense is not proven. This is not the same Wake Forest team that Vanderbilt fans saw last year and the 45 to 25 loss. So that is about it for the Wake Forest preview. I wish we had somebody that covers Wake Forest that could give us a more in-depth analysis, but I feel like we did an okay job of breaking down the key players. I think, too, it should be brought up, and and I'm, I'm sure a lot of fans know this, but I'm sure some of our listeners don't know this. Um, Clark Lee has worked under Dave, Dave Clawson for a while. Um, so Clark Lee knows how this offense runs. Not only has he seen it as a head coach, but he coached on the defense side of the ball when it was being ran uh, at Wake Forest. Um, I believe he was a linebacker coach at Wake Forest, um, particularly. So he, of all people, should know how linebacker play should happen against this, this sort of offense. With that being said, flip side of the coin, Dave Clawson knows how Clark Lee likes to run a defense. Um, how much of this is Clark Lee's defense and how much of this is is Nick Howell's? Bro, I don't know. We know the secondary is Dan Jackson, and I I hate to knock on people this early in the season, but Jesus Christ, Dan, we got to get it in gear, brother. It's just – it's not – whatever we are doing is not working. We just figure it out. Um, and, yeah, it's just I, – I think it will be a good chess match. Um in the, in the booth as well. So you've that's got, something that I'm interested in. You've got to figure something out because as much as we've discounted Mitch Griffiths as not being Sam Hartman, he's still a damn good quarterback. Yeah, and absolutely. He went 19-30, 329, three touchdowns and one pick against Elon. He's very talented. He's not Sam Hartman, but he's very talented. A little bit more of a runner than Hartman. Pulls the ball down a little bit quicker and takes off. Uh, but... There was some interesting movement with the gambling line. I do want to get to this before we get into our TDR cocktail break. The gambling line started at Vanderbilt plus 13 and a half, plus 12 and a half, depending on where you looked. The line currently, according to FanDuel, is Vanderbilt plus 10. So heavy money coming in on heavy Vanderbilt. Heavy money is coming in on the Vanderbilt spread right now. The over unders at 56 and a half. How do you feel about that spread starting out versus right now? I thought, honestly, I thought the spread starting out, I believe it opened, which then again, uh, everybody has their, all these different casinos have their own markets. Um, but the one I saw was 14 for Wake Forest. Um, I'm a FanDuel user myself. It is at 10 at Vanderbilt. Um, I think it's encouraging, certainly, that heavy money is coming in on Vanderbilt. I mean, that's a, that's a, it's a big, line. that's a big drop in, yeah. in a line. Um, honestly, and I'm not nearly as much into gambling as you are, so I want to hear your thoughts on this. I thought probably it should have opened at 10, but I guess, I don't know, all's well that ends well, I guess. I don't. But the, but the fact that money is coming in on Vanderbilt um, is very, very assuring to me because, I mean, Vegas, they rarely lie. I mean, it's people don't lie money when money is on money the line. Money doesn't lie. 
All right, that's the big key, watching markets. It's why gambling is interesting because you peel back the brain of people. Everybody can have their opinion. Everybody can have their prediction. But Vegas is literally putting their money on the line. Mm -hmm. And gamblers are literally putting their money on the line. They're not just making some prediction on a blog on the internet. So it does give me a little bit of hope. Uh, that there is some smart money coming in on Vanderbilt right now. But again, that line is currently sitting at plus 10. I don't think it'll drop any more than that. I don't think you'll see it get to nine and a half. If it does, that means that Vanderbilt has significant money coming in on it. If Vander if that line drops to Vanderbilt under a 10 point underdog, that means that's a ton of money coming in to push that line from 13 and a half or 14 points all the way down to under 10. And sort of for our listeners who aren't into gambling, can you explain how like significant it is for a line to drop that much? And we're only on today Wednesday, so it's dropped that much in what three, four days? Yeah. So the the biggest lines in football, it makes sense, even if you're not a gambler, that the most important points in these lines are 14. 10, 7, and 3. Those are the most valuable points in gambling. So that's why I had a pause. The cheaper points are that 10.5 through 13.5. Those are relatively cheap points if a little money's coming in on one side. Vegas just wants to get 50% of the money on both sides because then they make money off their VIG. So they don't care how the game plays out. They're not predicting the game. They're predicting getting money on 50% of both sides, which is why the line moves if there's money significantly on one side because they're trying to encourage money to come in on the other side. So Vanderbilt drops under 10. That 10 to 9.5 half half point is very, very, very valuable in gamblers' eyes. So I that means that there is significant bets coming in on Vanderbilt right now. So what you're saying is if it goes from 10 to 9.5 or 9, your eyes are bulging out of, the, yeah, out of your head, and you're like, "Oh my god!" Yeah, like, something's going to jump they, out. Yeah, okay. I got I got Vanderbilt on DraftKings at twelve and a half. I, I think plus twelve and a half. So there's a middle there. If Vegas is willing to create a middle where you can bet both sides and win on a realistic score, that means that there's been a lot of money coming on one on on one side, and they probably misset the line. And I think that's what happened. They put a little too much on Wake Forest, and a lot of money came in early on Vanderbilt. Would be my guess. I'm not setting lines in Vegas at all. But we do have our three keys to the game we've got to get into and our predictions for the Vanderbilt-Wake Forest matchup. But before we get into that, Trevor, it's time to grab yourself a cold one. It is time for the TDR cocktail break. Go grab a cold one, get it next to you, and tune in for me and Trevor's three keys to the game and predictions. Hey, yo, someone sponsored the cocktail hour, by the way. Bada bing, bada boom. We're back, baby. Trevor, it's time to get into our three keys of the game. What's your number one key? My number one key, number one, defensive line disruption. I know I've been whining and moaning about the lack of pressure that uh, Nick Howell has been bringing with the linebackers. I hate to go back on it, and I'm not necessarily going back on it, but I think with this style of offense – you are going to have to drop your backers into coverage most of the time or let them play a little bit more conservative and just wait and see if the back is taking the ball or not or if they're going to pass it. So defense, the front four in particular is going to have to be incredibly disruptive. Make him make a decision quick. Do not let him string it out. Most of the time last year, whenever Vanderbilt gave up these massive plays is whenever you allowed – uh, Sam Hartman to hold it in the pocket yep. for, I don't know, dude, it felt like 10 seconds. He would just hold it there and you're like, is he going to throw it? Is he going to run it? What are we going to do here? Defensive line has to get disruption. It, I Obviously everybody would love to result in sacks. That's the goal, but dude, you just got to, you just got to move the man in front of you. You got to displace the man in front of you. You have to make that pocket messy, make him make a decision quick. 
Thank you so much for having that as your key one, because that lets me limit how long of a phrase my key one is and doesn't make it a 1A, 1B. Get pressure. My key number one is get pressure with your front three or four, exactly like you just said. And the reason for that is you have to limit big plays. I don't have the quote pulled up in front of me right now, but Clark Lee had a quote about last year's game saying, that Vanderbilt a few times left their cornerbacks on islands and allowed some big plays to happen. That cannot happen this year. You have to drop more guys back into coverage, which means your front three or four have to get pressure by themselves without exotic blitz packages. It just is. Those guys have to make an impact. Darren Agu has to make an impact with his first game back. Linus Zunk has to make an impact. Uh, Wataha needs to make an impact. Clifton. Every Clifton, every single person on that defensive line needs to be dominant. If you have your hand in the dirt on defense, you need to be playing with your hair on. And fire. the reason for that, my key number one is also you've got to limit big plays, which means that you have to keep safeties high. You have to. You cannot allow Wake Forest to hit those big plays in the slow mesh under Mitch, Mitch Griffiths. They are probably running a little bit less of that slow mesh traditional style that Dave Clawson likes to run less than they ran with Hartman. But Mitch Griffiths threw for 329 yards against Elon. 151 of those yards came from three plays. You cannot allow that to happen if you are Vanderbilt. So get pressure with your front three or four and limit big plays is my key number one. I know that's pretty obvious, uh, but damn, the secondary has got to step up and that defensive line has to step up in a big way. The secondary is going to be helped out by the front three and four getting pressure and not just uh, flower footing around. You know what I mean? I'm trying to keep it clean. Um, I, 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 I watch my, I watch my language a little bit on this pod. I try to, at least, um, it's, it's for the kids. Yeah. This is the dichotomy of TDR is, is I'm the crazy one, but I, I do like to, I like to keep it a little bit clean for the, yeah, for, the you're, for the kids out there. You're the unhinged crazy one, but I'm the asshole. No, you're because you're not mean. You're not like a mean person. I'm a nice guy. Yeah, you are. Yeah. You, that makes it seem like you're a mean person. My bio on the TDR, the doorport.com. We have some great articles from guys like Brian Carlson, Jacob Scholl, always killing it with the six pack. Uh, Jay, do whenever Brain McPherson, Vandy Topic, guys are killing it on there. Whenever so the six the pack hits the hits the TL and hits the website, that's when I know we're like, dang, it's football time. Had baby. to promote, had to promote the boys, had to promote the writers. But my bio on tw- on the doorboard.com is literally easily unlikable, easily dislikable. I disagree. I would, I would I, say I don't say it's think you're, I don't think you're a dislikable person, to be quite frank. You'll have to ask some people I've interacted with in the past. But Trevor, what's your key number two? My key number two is decision making from AJ Swan. Um, I feel like too. I, I sort of hate my keys because this is one of my big things um, that I sort of hate about football broadcasters. They're like, "Oh, what are the keys of the game?" And it's like, "Oh yeah, um, don't turn the ball over, score points, and um, yep. I don't know." Don't don't commit dumb penalties. And everybody who's watched football is sitting there. And they're like, yeah, that's the entire point of the freaking game. Every game, whether it's Pee Wee or whether it's NFL and the Super Bowl, that's the entire objective of the game. So I, I sort of hate how bland mine are right now, but they're I mean, they're cliche because they're true. Swan's decision making has to be perfect in this game. I it, it's it's. It's, it doesn't have to be good. It's got to be perfect. We cannot. This offense that Vanderbilt is going up against is too high powered for Vanderbilt to leave points and to leave yards on the board. Um, do I want him to play conservative? No. That's one of the things I love about Swan is that he's a gunslinger. But with being a gunslinger comes possibly turning the ball over. How can he balance that? I don't know. Um so it's it's sort of a, a, a damned if you do, damned if you don't type thing. But man, improved decision making, particularly in the red zone, cannot turn the ball over in the red zone. Unacceptable. Turnovers, if it's an arm punt due to whatever, it sucks. But it is what it is. Cannot turn the ball over in the red zone. So I'm gonna, I, I'm actually gonna edit my my number two as a decision making in the red zone. Cliches are cliches for a reason. And as the season goes on, our keys will be able to be more specific because we will have more reps on film to know what the problems are and know what the possibilities are to expose on the opponent. Right now, we're running off one game from Wake Forest against an FCS opponent, a good FCS opponent that they 
pretty much beat handily, but they struggled a little bit with against Elon, 37-17. to But Vanderbilt fans know Elon well. 42-31 last year, Vanderbilt beat them, but that's a good program. But my key number two is very similar, and I, I hate that I'm saying it. I also don't like my keys here. But win the turnover battle. I hate it. I, I, I hate it. true. But last year, if you were at that game or watched that game that Vanderbilt ended up losing 45-25, to 25, this was the game that Clark Lee and the staff realized that Mike Wright could not be the guy. Read off his stats from that game. He was, quick. Mike Wright was 8 for 15 for 35 yards, no touchdowns, and a pick with a 2.7 QBR. And the interception, I think, is what you're hitting on. All interceptions are not created equal. Vanderbilt was up 3 to nothing at the beginning of that game against Wake Forest, had just gotten a goal line stop, and Mike Wright threw an inexcusable interception that was returned for a touchdown by uh, Wake Forest player Kobe Davis. And that completely changed the trajectory and outlook of that game. It changed the momentum. It changed everything. That is the play that A.J. Swan cannot make. And he did not make plays like that against Wake Forest last year. A.J. Swan stats against Wake Forest, 8 for 11 for 146 yards and two touchdowns, 95.4 QBR. That's what we want to see out of A.J. this game. So win the turnover battle. But more importantly, don't make those turnovers that are so costly to momentum. You saw what can happen last season against Wake Forest, specifically when you make turnovers that are costly at the wrong time. So it's a cliche, and cliches are cliches for a reason. Win the turnover battle is my key number two. Yeah, absolutely. And before I get to my key number three, I want to shout out Phoebe real quick for being an absolute angel on the pod right now. Phoebe, you are being so good. And we really appreciate it. And I'm sure our listeners do as well. She's just sleeping. Well, now she's going to scratch a little bit, but I don't know if y'all heard that, but she's giving herself a little scratch. She's being so good right now. My key number three, play keep away with the new rule, which I hate. I think I should go ahead and preface. I hate, 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 hate this new rule it it's it was shout out to hmd he said the whole thing about player safety was uh what was a lie this rule is not about player safety it is about putting more pocket or putting more money in the pockets of advertisers you don't care about player safety you don't care about the fan experience you don't care about the way the game is played the ncaa the sec and the tv networks all they care about is lining their pockets and this is all this rule is i absolutely despise it with every fiber of my being with that being said, you got to use that new rule to your advantage this week. You got to play keep away. You got to keep that clock running. The more you can rack up time of possession, the more you can keep the ball away from Wake Forest offense, the higher percentage you have of winning this ball game. Use that rule to your advantage. Tote the rock. And so going into part number three, I guess, or my key number three, part two of it, is the run game. Got to get the run game going. You have to open up holes. You cannot just be dilly-dallying around and have these these runs that waste it down for no yard or a loss. With that being said, if anybody on the staff is listening, start Cedric Alexander. The kids got it. I don't know. And this is my big thing with the depth chart. They're like, oh, depth chart doesn't matter. Yeah, I know. Yes, Arya, I know that Darren Agu has been listed as the starting pass rusher on the depth chart, and he's been hurt. I know that. I'm I'm very well aware. But whenever it comes to the running back depth chart, that actually has been true. The ratio of carries has been true based on the depth chart. So that was my thing. He's listed as number three. Could he be number one? Who the hell knows? I know that you're going to have to give Patrick Smith. I know that you're going to have to give Chase Gillespie carries. But Cedric should be getting most of the carries. If he starts, I don't care. But he should be getting the ball 60 60 to 70% of the time in the run game. Tote the rock, offensive line, man up, move the man in front of you, assert your dominance on the guys in front of you, and and just tote the rock and dominate, 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 dominate the time position. Use this new rule, this bogus rule to your advantage. Keep the ball out of their hands. Longer you keep the ball out of their hands, less points they score. Simple as that. I like that you brought up the new rule because we haven't brought it up at all. It's disgusting. It's awful. Literally every single fan can see through your bullshit. NCAA, ESPN, everyone involved in the sham 
yep. that is that rule change. It's absolutely a sham. It was posted on Reddit College Football at Reddit CFV, CFB, but there was a user that posted on Reddit and uh, timed the advertisements of one of the games, the Camping World game. Uh, was that Florida State LSU? Yes, it was. The game started at 7.45 p.m. and ended at 11.08 p.m. The game presentation time was right at 2 hours and 27 minutes. The ads were, a, there were 131 advertisements played for 55 minutes and 48 seconds. And the caveat he gave to this was he immediately started the game presentation clock the moment that the com traditional commercial break ended. So this didn't even include the, the Camping World Classic presented by Celsius. It didn't even include the part of the most expensive live read presenting sponsor ads. Sham money, nothing to do, not one thing to do with player safety. Absolutely not. It infuriates me. We noticed it. I noticed it week one against Hawaii that every single commercial break, the guy bringing out the board, it was two and a half or three and a half minutes every single time. There used to be a minute, minute and a half commercials. Not anymore. Every single one is a is a minimum of two and a half minutes. Fans can feel it in the stadium, and the fan experience is tremendously worse for Absolutely. what you have done, and you are ruining college football with your greed, ignorance, and thirst for money. Absolutely. Fuck you, NCAA, ESPN, everyone involved. That's how I feel. That's how fans feel. But my number three key to the game is offensive line. It's time to see what you're made of. Mm -hmm. You brought up the running game. I 100% agree. The running game looked a lot better against Alabama A&M, but that is Alabama A&M. The other side of that, Vanderbilt has to throw the ball against Wake Forest. They have to be productive and efficient in the passing game. They have to put together extended long drives. You cannot allow this talented Wake Forest pass rush to disrupt Vanderbilt's offense and get hits on A.J. Swan throughout the game. You just can't. Grease gang, it's time to live up to the hype that we have been giving you all season. This is the game. This is the time to show what you're made of. I know that's another obvious one. Don't let the quarterback get hit. I know that's really easily said and really difficult to do, but it has to be done. AJ Swan has to have time to allow pass to allow routes to develop from Will Shepard, Jade McGowan, Quincy, Demarion Thomas, all of those guys. Gamarian Carter, not Demarian Thomas. That's a defensive lineman. But so far, I have seen nothing from this offensive line that shows me they're going to have success against Wake Forest. There's just something in my gut that tells me that this offensive line is going to step up to the challenge. And they need to. Hey, Coach Blaz, Julian Hernandez, Castillo, everybody. People are calling you guys soft. They're saying this offensive line is soft. They're saying it's overhyped. They're saying you guys don't know what you need to do in RPOs. It is time to prove people wrong in this game. This is the game to where you go in and you assert your dominance over the man in front of you. Make them regret scheduling this game. Show them that you are the bigger offensive line. Show them that you are the more physical guys in the trenches. Do not let a man win a rep over you. Win every single rep. Improve the people who are just absolutely dogging you guys right now. Prove them wrong. This is the game to where you make a stand and say that, hey, this is the offensive line that we thought it was going to be going into the season. This is the offensive line that we were hyping up going into the season. This is the offensive line to where we thought this is the most talented and the most deep offensive line that we have had in a decade. It is time to live up to the hype. It is time to show the people that you can win one-on-one -on -one every single rep. Time to bully some guys in the trenches. And I asked the question I quoted where we asked for people's predictions and opinions on the Wake Forest game. I quoted it kind of asking a question, is this the most important game of the year for Vanderbilt? And got some responses from a few people. It absolutely is. The reason that I asked that question and why I think it is the most important game maybe not individually maybe not just the Kentucky game I think is probably the biggest game of the year with all the hype around it it's an in-conference game I think the Auburn game is huge I think the Missouri game is huge I think the South Carolina game is huge but this game will change the overall trajectory and outlook for this program 
if Vanderbilt is able to beat Wake Forest as a double-digit road underdog, you will start to see national attention and the national narrative about Vanderbilt football will change. Team three under Clark Lee, after what we saw in 2019, 2020, and 2021, has the opportunity to change the national narrative about Vanderbilt football in one game. If that doesn't get you fired up, then you need to get your, uh, what did you call it last episode? Your grit, your grit you need, you need some grit, grit you need some grit osterone. Because holy hell, the more I think about this game, the more I think about the opportunity in front of this Vanderbilt football team, this game, and I don't say this lightly, means a hell of a lot more to Vanderbilt football than it means to Wake Forest football. Dave Clawson, this is no slight at what he has built at Wake Forest. He has established a very solid program from a private university inside of a Power 5 conference. Vanderbilt has not done that. There are other challenges associated with being in the SEC. Yes, the competition is stiffer, da 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 of course. We all know this. But Wake Forest is established. Vanderbilt is trying to get established. You can establish yourself in this game. Let's step up. Let's get it done. We've got the dogs. We've got the guys. But Trevor, that gets us perfectly into our predictions. Before we give our predictions at the end, are we going to read other people's predictions too or just ours? Or yep. do we want to Let, let's let's go through and read some predictions that we saw because there were some good responses here. Yeah. Let me get this pulled up. And I think we're on, which I'm not going to say it, um, but we'll we'll wait till the prediction. So we got quite a few responses, uh, some serious, some not so serious. Uh, I'm pretty proud of the edit that I put out. We're working on those edits here at TDR. Graphics are getting better, so go check that out on Twitter at The Door Report. It's pretty sick, I'm not going to lie. But uh, So first response, Justin Kemp, A1 Day 1 follower, listener. He said, uh, Justin Kemp says, when the schedule came out, I skipped over this game. I was more quick to give us three SEC wins and came back to this game. This game is weird. I'm excited, but nervous as hell. But we're going to win. I feel like there's going to be some eyebrows raised for this team after this game. Fair assessment. Not not a bad prediction. Kind of hitting on what we were saying, that this is kind of a key, pivotal game in the schedule of where the rest of the season can go. It gives you room for error in SEC play to still make a bowl game. If you lose this game, you have to go 3-1 and one in the stretch of Kentucky, Missouri, Florida, and Auburn. You have to go 3-1. and one which is a tough task. Two and two is a lot, I don't want to say easier of a task, but a lot more achievable of a goal than three and one and more realistic to get to the ultimate goal that I think is there for team three under Clark Lee, and that's a bowl game. Mm -hmm. So great response there from Justin Kemp as always. Uh, Kisha B at Kishi underscore B says Vandy by Fitty. Good. I feel that. Uh, Axel, day one, A1, says slow start for Vandy. Turn it on in the second half. Hay ball fumble recovery for a game-winning TD. <laughs> I feel that in my heart. I feel that in my soul, Axel. Uh, the admirable, ah, not the admirable, the admiral. The admirable admiral. The admirable admiral. Uh, at the admiral VU says 31-27, Swan to Shepard for the game-winning. Game winner with time expiring. Love that. If that happens, you'll see me running around the streets of Nashville uh, in an absolute frenzy. In a frenzy. There's the word I'm looking for. See? Same same brain wavelength right now. That's, uh, that's that liberal art major coming out of me. Nashville Steeler at Vandy Steeler 23 says 2717 wake. Doors stick around close. Deke score a late TD to ice it. I pray I'm wrong, though. Can't really argue that's. A very valid prediction. That's that's a that's a low scoring for Vanderbilt though. Only seventeen. Very low scoring with the inexperienced secondaries. But I think there are some question marks on this on both of these offenses that are being glazed over right now. I think that there was talent lost on both sides. That it's just kind of being written off. You don't. It's kind of what we've talked about occasionally with Tennessee. Regardless, you don't just casually replace number one or number two at different skill position groups. And Wake Forest has lost their number one and number two wide receivers from last year, their number one starting quarterback, and they've lost their number two and three running backs. Vanderbilt lost their starting running back, lost Mike Wright, who we've shared our opinions about his play on the field, but he did lead Vanderbilt to two victories in SEC play with A.J. Swan out with injury. So 
27 17 wake i think it's a little low scoring it's low scoring according to vegas's prediction with the over under set at 56 and a half but i don't think an unrealistic uh prediction if there. we only scored 17 points against the first competition we see it's time to hit the panic button yeah then then it might be that means that the offensive line really struggled yep uh, and it means opinion. aj struggled yeah it means everyone struggled yeah, Vanderbilt the, the only team scored struggled 17. Uh, Luke at TDBIY2 says Vandy 34, Wake 31. I like that prediction. We'll see why in a second. Uh, George Barclay says Wake Forest has a silly tradition where they TP the quad after a loss. On Saturday, the doors in their all-white uniforms TP a, a legacy Federal Credit Union Stadium. What a stupid name. With a series of explosive plays for a gritty 42-35 to 35 win. I love the comments. There's some more, but that that's all we'll get to on this one. It's time to get into our predictions, Trevor. We have labored over this decision. We have labored over this prediction. We've actually we've been two and zero so far. Actually, decently accurate. I would say the Hawaii game we were a little off. Uh, Alabama A and M, both of us were pretty accurate on our final score predictions. But Trevor, what do you have? Vanderbilt at Wake Forest, 10 a.m. Saturday on the road. How are you feeling? I hate that I'm about to do this. I really hate that I'm about to do this. Boys, if you're listening, prove me wrong. Wake Forest 42, Vanderbilt 28. I I hate, I hate, I hate, I hate that I just said that. Prove me wrong. I just, I don't, I, just, I don't think the secondary can hold up. I just I don't there's they haven't shown me they haven't shown me that they can defensive line hasn't shown me that they can get pressure and be disruptive. Um, yeah, this. Oh, God. Yeah. Forty two, twenty eight. I hate that. I'm saying so I really what do. you locking in forty two to twenty eight. Yeah, well, I'll hit the Zen or just hit the Zen locking it in. Forty two to twenty eight. I'm glad you gave that prediction because you gave the other side that I was struggling with. I actually think this game goes one of two ways. I think Vanderbilt gets kind of dominated and our secondary Vanderbilt secondary is completely unable to stop this Wake Forest offense. And Mitch Griffiths throws for 300 plus multiple touchdowns. Vanderbilt loses by 17 plus points. I think that's one way this game could go. If the game is close, I have no justifiable reason to say this besides the ones I've already given. Mitch Griffiths is not proven. None of these receivers for Wake Forest are proven. They have no depth at running back. Their offensive line is undersized and struggled against Elon. Wake Forest defense is solid, but they struggle at secondary. I don't see that they have the guys that can cover Vanderbilt's receivers and skill position players. I just don't see it. I think they will do solid against Vanderbilt's rushing attack. I am very nervous that Wake Forest defensive line is going to get a lot of pressure on A.J., but if the Grease Gang is able to hold up to that, I think there are holes to pick apart in this Wake Forest secondary. I think Wake Forest offense is going to struggle a little bit more than we are expecting them to. I just don't think you replace an explosive playmaker like A.T. Perry and like Sam Hartman as easily as Wake Forest fans think they are going to. I think you're going to see a significant drop in explosive plays out of Wake Forest. I don't think this Wake Forest offense is that much better than Hawaii. That might be a hot take. They are better. They're better. But Shager was unconscious yeah. against Vanderbilt. He was putting the ball exactly where he wanted to. Shager did not look like that against Stanford, and that was not because Shager sucks. It's a quarterback's like a shooter in basketball. Some days that ball just feels like there's a magnet where you want it to go. And some days it feels like you, it doesn't matter what you're doing. That ball's just going to brick off the rim. Same thing with the quarterback. He was on against Vanderbilt. I think that's pretty similar to how it's going to feel against Wake Forest. Some big plays are going to happen, but I think Vanderbilt's going to control the time of possession. I don't think Wake Forest is going to be able to run the ball against Vanderbilt's defense. They struggled against Elon to run the ball. I'm going. You're 48, 42 to 28. Wake Forest beats the doors. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Sadie. Oh, my God. Doors 31. Oh, my God. Wake Forest Demon Deacons 31. 34-31. Oh. Doors dub 3-0. and 
cover the spread, ML hits. I'm feeling it in my gut. I'm 90% sure on that prediction. The other 10% of me thinks we're going to get the shit kicked out of us. Will, don't make me change my prediction. It's too late. You oh, locked God. in on the Zen. Vanderbilt 34, lock in on the Zen. Wake Forest 31, Doors Dub, move to 3-0. and oh, The revolution is here, oh, and God. it will be televised, oh, baby. <laughs> I need that. Let's go. I need that Let's so go. bad. I need that. I need that injected into my veins. Oh, God. So, so, Trevor, before we close it out here on episode 236, give a recap of your three keys to the game and then uh, give a recap of your prediction. That makes me want to change my prediction. I know it's I locked it late. in, but, oh, late. God, Will's got me going, baby. Ugh. Keys. Number one, defensive line disruption. Front three, front four. You got to, you got to, got to, got to move the man in front of you. You got to create a messy pocket. You got to make them make quick decisions. You got to make them make bad decisions. Key number two, swan decision-making, particularly swan decision-making in the red zone. Cannot have dumb, silly, sophomore. I know you're a sophomore, brother. I get it. I know you're going to make mistakes. I get it. I understand. In this game, we cannot make mistakes in the red zone. We cannot leave points on the board. We cannot give them a favorable field position. Key number three, Tote the rock. Show me that you can dominate in the trenches. Show me that you can dominate time possession. Grease gang. It's time to get greasy. It's time to get slippery. It's time to open up some holes. I need to see some holes so big that Mack trucks go through them. I need Seti to tote the rock 100 plus yards. I need to see Patrick absolutely show incredible burst. I need Chase Gillespie with a bunch of hogs in front of him, paving the way for him on a screen. Boys. I don't believe. Help me with my unbelief. And what was your prediction, Trevor? Ugh, I hate it. Wake Forest 42, Vanderbilt 28. Just had to get it out of your mouth one more time. Oh my my three keys to the game. Number one, get pressure and limit big plays. Number two, win the turnover battle. Number three, offensive line. Let's see what you're made of. And my prediction was Vanderbilt dub 34 to 31. Doors go to Winston-Salem and get the win. Before I close it out, boys, if anybody on this Vanderbilt team is listening, you have an opportunity to change the national narrative for Vanderbilt football. It's time to get out there. It's time to get the dog out of you. And it's time to exercise some demons. Let's go whip some demon deacon ass. Let's go fucking do it, baby. Let's go. Let's go, man. Let's go. For myself, Will Byram, and my co host, Trevor Hool, and this has been episode. 236 of the door report powered by Corey perkins of parks realty and as always screw the balls let's go pee baby Woo!